Good morning, everybody. You are listening to K Talk Radio 1640 AM. This is the show, Utah Home Sweet Home. I am your host, Yoshi Shiraki. And today, our very special guest is actually a friend of mine by the name of Jason Justice. Now, Jason is getting ready to purchase another home. And so he was calling me, asking me a bunch of questions like, what do I do here? What do I do there? Um, he's not shopping just yet, but he's getting to that point where he's getting ready to start shopping. And so I thought, you know what? These are questions that are great questions that you should ask me on my show because then a lot of people, if you have these questions, I'm sure a lot of other people have these questions. And in fact, not only do I think that a lot of other people have these questions, I know because I get these questions asked to me all the time. So I thought what I would do is I would invite Jason in to come and share his questions with all of you so that I could answer these questions. Jason, thank you so much for coming in today. Oh, thanks for having me. This is awesome. Yes, yes. So, you know, you hear all these different people that we have on our guests, uh, all these different guests that we have on our show, sorry. Last week we had a multifamily investor who buys apartment buildings. The week before we had an Olympian. And we have an array of, an array of um, different guests. We've got uh, John Madsen next week who played for the Oakland Raiders. And then we'll have Nap Orchards in a couple weeks who played for the Real Salt Lake and Portland Timbers. Um, and it really just kind of dawned on me that there's probably this like, we've got all these experts coming in sharing how they do what they do to grow their business to give you guys tips. But then there's a lot of people out there who are probably thinking, hey man, I just want to buy my house. I just want to buy my first house or I just want to sell my house. And so I thought this could be really, really valuable. So Jason, um, you're getting ready to possibly buy another house here shortly. Yes. And you've come up with some really good questions. And so why don't you hit me with one of them? Okay, so yeah, so once I just contact a realtor or, or um, like what's the whole entire process like? Like step one through the whole entire process. Like yeah. What do I have to no, great question, great question. So there's a diff lot of different ways. So first of all, uh, a really good realtor out there is me. So you should contact me. <laughs> I already did. <laughs> but there's going to be a few people that you're going to need right away, which is a, if, unless you have the cash, like a bunch of cash sitting in your bank account that you're going to use to pay for the house all by yourself, then if you don't have that, you're going to need some type of lender who's going to loan you the money, right? And so most likely, most people out there are going to need some type of mortgage broker, loan officer, a bank who's going to assist them to purchase this property. So they're going to need to get pre-qualified and figure out, based off of their income, based off of their current debt that they have, how much are they going to be able to qualify for, which will give them an idea of what price point they're going to be shopping at, right? So you don't want to be shopping at, let's say, a six for $600,000 homes if you find out you're only qualified for up to four hundred fifty. dollars It's a waste of time, hypothetically. Um, and so it's good to get pre-qualified before you even start the shopping process. You might have an idea of what you could qualify for, and so if you have a good idea, yeah, maybe I guess you could go see a house or two, get a feel for what's out there, but it's usually smarter to figure out what you're qualified for, and then, and then with your real estate agent, go out there and start shopping for that price point. So to answer that question, yes, the two people you're gonna to wanna to get in touch with is a real estate agent and a mortgage broker or loan officer, someone who's gonna help you with the getting the loan. Now, I would say traditionally, most people call a real estate agent first. And the real estate agent then will recommend or refer a, lead, uh, a loan officer or a mortgage broker that they work with, and then that individual will go and usually get pre-qualified there. But if you've got a good relationship with your bank, you know, you, you bank with whoever, and uh, it doesn't hurt to do it the other way around. Most people just usually call their agent, and then the agent refers them to the person, but you could definitely go to the mortgage broker first if you wanted, uh, and then go to an agent second. Sometimes maybe you already know a mortgage broker, maybe it's a nephew, a cousin, a brother, a sister, and then they might be actually able to refer you to a good agent, right? And so those two people are going to be the two people you need to contact first, in my personal opinion, before you really start shopping. I mean, like I said, you could probably go to open houses, just take a peek at what's out there for what price point, but until you know what price point you can shop in, um, it's usually not that advantageous to go out there and just look at homes that maybe hypothetically aren't uh, a price that you'd be able to qualify for, if that makes sense. 
Okay. So, yeah, no, great question. So that's the first step. Um, but then after that, hypothetically what will happen is once you know the price point you qualify for, right? So your mortgage broker says, Jason, here's what you qualify for. Then your real estate agent will go onto the MLS to see what properties are available for sale right now at that price point. And they'll create what's called a hot sheet, which basically automatically will email you every day a property that meets your criteria hits the market. And so you look at it in your inbox, and if you like what you see, you can go over there and go look at the property. And if you don't like it, of course, you, you don't have to go look at it. Um, but at that point, now you can start shopping with your real estate agent, going to look at these homes. You now know what you qualify for, and you get out there until you find a property that you like. And right now, it's a pretty competitive market. So if you, I always tell my clients, you know, they say, how much should I offer? And I says, it depends on how much you love or like the house. So if you, this is my personal advice, my personal opinion, what I literally do myself. If I love the property, love it, love it, love it, have to have it, want to raise my kids in this home, this is the neighborhood, this is the street, this is the house that I have to live in, I submit the highest offer I possibly can submit. So even if that means it's 10,000 over asking price, 20,000 over asking price, if I absolutely love it, I will give it my best foot forward. Because if I get outbid giving my best foot forward, then I know there was nothing else I could do, right? What you don't want to do is go, let's lowball them. And this is the house you have to have. You freaking love it. And you lowball them looking for a deal. And of course, then I come along, or the guy that thinks like me comes along and gives his best foot forward and outbids you. And now you're going, dang it, we lost this house. And you could have offered 10,000, 15,000 more, but you just were trying to get a deal. And there's a time and a place for a deal. And that was, you know, 2008. <laughs> we're in 2020. And so, with the market corrects, we're probably going to find ourselves in a, in a place where we can look for deals again. But right now, based off of this current market, the strategy really is if you love it to submit your best foot forward because if you don't get it, you knew you tried your best because a lot of times they don't counter you. So a lot of people will say, well, let's, let's lowball them and they'll counter us back, right? Um, and then we can always go up. No, they don't always counter you back. If they get multiple offers at the same time, then they may just pick the best one and never get back to anybody else saying, hey, you know, we picked the highest and best. In this case, do you have a higher and better? I mean, they're just going to accept the best and now you've lost out. So if you love it, I suggest submitting your best foot forward. If you like it a lot or if you, if you do, you know, it's not something you have to have, then yeah, that's when you can submit something maybe less uh, aggressive. And then if you don't get it, you don't really care because you didn't love it, love it, but you liked it enough obviously to submit an offer. Um, but that's going to keep you competitive. That approach will keep you competitive in the homes you really do like. And hopefully, you will get the home you really do like. And the best way to do that, obviously, is to give it your best shot. So does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, so then now, once you've got this um, approach down, you're just going to start going out there, looking at houses, finding the ones that you like. Um, but a great, great strategy because it's such a competitive market, is if you work with an investor-friendly real estate agent like myself. Now, I'm not the only real estate-friendly uh, agent out there. There's a lot of others. And the reason I say that, though, is because for those of you who listen to my show, we have had guest after guest after guest on this show who kill it in fixing and flipping houses. That's what I do as well. I fix and flip houses. And I got a bunch of friends and colleagues that also fix and flip houses. So when I get a client that says, listen, I'm looking for a home in this neighborhood at this price point, we're qualified for this amount, we'll look on the MLS, but then, but then the very next thing that I do is I will call all of my friends who fix and flip homes and say, do you have something that you're remodeling right now that's almost done, it's going to hit the market in this area and this price point? And if they do, then I can take my client over to that house to have a peek at this brand new, beautifully fixed and flipped home that's about to hit the market that nobody else knows about but us. And as long as my client likes it, we now have the opportunity to submit an offer on this particular property with no competition, having to worry about highest and best. I have helped so many of my buyer clients get into homes by this particular, uh, by this particular uh, technique, right? 
So if you happen to know a real estate agent who's well connected in the investment world, <coughs> excuse me, then there's a really good chance that you're going to be able to find off-market properties that other people are not going to have access to, which then means you don't have to go crazy and be in these bidding wars that you have to fight against. Um, do you have any questions in regards to any of that so far? No, no, thank you. Yeah, okay, perfect. So, so basically, you know, that's the process of getting from, okay, I'm getting ready to start shopping now, and now I want to go out there and um, actually start shopping. You're going to, like I said, get in touch with those two people first, and then once you know what you're qualified for, get out there, start shopping, and, you know, submit your offers accordingly to basically how much you love it. Okay. Yeah. And now what about the process of now? How, how would I submit an offer? What would be that process? Like, what's the next step if I decide I want something? Oh, yeah, good question. I'm ready to say, hey, I want to buy this house for this price. Then what? what great. Do after that? Yes, great question. So now it's time to write the offer up. And basically, we call it the REPC, which stands, it's an acronym, R-E-P-C. It stands for Real Estate Purchase Contract. It's the state approved, Utah's state approved purchase contract written by Utah attorneys. Um, all real estate agents are supposed to use that contract. Uh, it becomes a contract that we all amongst each other know very well. Our job as real estate agents is to understand that contract because we assist our clients when it's time to make an offer with how to fill this out. Of course, it's always a good idea if you don't understand the contract to seek an attorney's advice. We as real estate agents are not attorneys. We don't practice law. And so it's a good idea. I always tell my clients, if there's something that you don't understand here that you don't feel comfortable with the explanation I'm giving you, feel free to call an attorney and have them explain to you maybe differently, you know, that makes you feel more comfortable on how you want to approach this particular paragraph of the REPSI, uh, the real estate purchase contract. Typically, I can explain it in a pretty simple term. They also have the ability to read it and understand it in their ability to read. Uh, so usually they're not contacting an attorney. But I say that if for any reason you don't feel comfortable, maybe English isn't your first language, whatever it might be, it's a good idea. You're dealing with a, with a contract, with a massive purchase to understand it. It's a good idea to reach out to a real estate attorney. Anybody out there needs one. I have some referrals I can share with you. They also own title companies, which is great because you can do your title closing with that attorney and it works out really well because now you've got a uh, escrow officer or title company that has the uh, legal background of the individual who owns it and it's just for me, a little more reassuring. I like using uh, Jeff Braylio, who's been on this show quite a bit. He's a, an attorney and an escrow officer who does title work. And so I do most of my transactions as far as an investor with him. I should say not most. I pretty much do all the investing transactions I do with him because he can basically look at what I'm trying to do, make sure that it makes sense. I get a second set of eyes on it. And then, of course, we can close it. But you're going to go through basically and determine some things on the contract, like what the, what you want to offer, the price you want to offer, earnest money that you want to put up when you submit the offer, the timelines that you think that you can close this property, do your due diligence by, have your financing and appraisal deadline by, and, and those things, your due diligence is something that is going to be more on how quick you can get a home inspector in there, if, there, if home inspectors are busy and they are right now, they might be booked out four or five days, so you want to make sure you have a, a, you know, a good amount of time in there for your due diligence. But then as far as like financing and appraisal, when you can close, those are going to be in, uh, pieces of information that your real estate agent and your lender are going to coordinate and help you understand, okay, your loan is probably going to take 30, 35, 40 days to fund. Different banks are faster than others. Um, but your due diligence period, I say, is a you know a good amount of a, a good amount of time that will pretty much allow you to be able to do anything that you want to do in your due diligence period is is probably 14 days. Sellers probably want to see a lesser amount of days. They don't want to see 14 days, and then on that 14th day, you change your mind and cancel the contract. So they want to know that hey, you're going to go in here in seven to ten days, do your due diligence. And if you don't like it, you'll cancel your contract in seven to 10 days, and then I can put my house back on the market and start over, versus hanging there for 14 days. As a buyer, you want as long as you can. As a seller, you want the buyer to do it as short as possible. So you're probably going to put something in there. 
depending on how competitive that house is, seven to 14 days. So if my clients feel that they really, really have this, want this house, one way to make your offer more attractive is, you know, not obviously just the price, but uh, shortening your due diligence period can make it attractive as well. I know a lot of, of my investor friends when we fix and flip houses, that's one of the things that we like to look at is how many days are they asking for due diligence because if they back out for any reason, I have to wait all this time to put it back on the market, right? So we look at shorter due diligence and sometimes shorter due diligence is more attractive than an extra thousand dollars, right? Your offer might be one thousand less than the next guy. He offered one thousand more, but he's asking for fourteen days due diligence. You're only asking for seven. I may pick that offer that I'm going to make a little less on just because it happens quicker, if that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, then basically after you fill that out, you're now submitting it to your, uh, to the real estate agent who represents the seller. And right now the way the market is, because most houses have multiple offers, it's a good idea to submit your best offer. Um, and a lot of agents will tell you, Hey, listen, we're going to, you know, we got multiple offers. And so we are going to, not counter back anybody, so submit your highest and best on your first try. And then basically just be prepared that uh, you're gonna give it your best shot and cross your fingers that hopefully you get the contract that's picked. And again, as I mentioned, terms, which is stuff like your due diligence period, your financing and appraisal deadline, those can be attractive as well by shortening the time frames on those. So terms can sometimes help you win a deal uh, even more than price sometimes. Uh, price usually is going to make more people go f for one offer versus the other, but what if you got two offers that are at the exact same price, you know, hypothetically? Both offers came in at 400000 and one has 14 days due diligence, the other one has seven. Then it's, you know, price is the same. It's a no-brainer on who they're going to pick based off of terms, if that makes sense. Yeah, and then I had a question just regarding that as well. Yeah. So, so a home can have more than one of those contracts at the, at the same time from multiple buyers, is that correct? Correct, yep. Okay, and then does it cost any money at this point? Great question. So, at this point, no money is, it has not cost any money at this point. So hypothetically, all you have done now is got a, real, a mortgage broker, a loan officer to tell you, to pre-qualify you, to tell you how much you can purchase who's going to help you with the loan. So at this point, no money's been paid to them. Real estate agent, no money's been paid to them. Now you're submitting an offer with, let's just say, for example, a thousand dollar earnest money. You don't necessarily have to give that thousand dollars yet because your offer hasn't been accepted yet. Okay. That, okay. Right. And so, um, the house that you're submitting an offer on may have, let's just say five offers on it. This house now, the seller now has to pick, an offer from the five, which one they want to go with, and if you're the lucky one they pick, then yes, you, at that point you now have to give your earnest money to your real estate agent, who will either submit it to a title company or a brokerage. Okay, so and so after the earnest money is given, yep, um, is there a time period between the final closing? Is there what if someone decides that after their earnest money was given, something happens, are they able to get that back? Is there any part of that process you might be able to explain a little bit? Yes, that's a great question. In fact, that's I get asked that question all the time. If I cancel my contract, can I get my thousand dollars back, my two thousand, my five thousand, however many thousand earnest money back? You know, my sister bought a house in Los Angeles long time ago at the crash, probably like two thousand eight, nine, right? And it was, you know, Los Angeles, even though we were as a country and in an economical real estate crash, Los Angeles was still pretty competitive. The prices just went down, but the competitiveness of buying a home was still there. So I remember her telling me um, her real estate agent had suggested that they put $60,000 as earnest money. I was like, that's like a down payment. That's not earnest money um, here, right? And so like, especially back then, back then I was like, wait, 60,000 earnest money or 6,000 or 16? She's like, no, 60. I was like, holy cow, she goes, that's how you guys are going to stand out and be competitive. And they put, they loved the home, great area. It was the school district they wanted their kids in in Burbank. And so they basically submitted their highest offer that they could submit, $60,000 earnest money. And, you know, luckily they were the ones that got picked and got the house. Um, so that's a big concern. When you're dropping 1000 2000 10000 60000 as earnest money, the question I get asked all the time is, 
can I get that back if I change my mind? What if I do a home inspection and realize that the roof is sagging or something's wrong with the home? Do I get that money back? And the answer is hypothetically yes, but there's a certain amount of time. But it really depends. So I say depends because if you write up the contract so that you don't get your earnest money back, then no, you won't. But very few people, if, if very few people, I should say, ever write a contract with uh, no, no due diligence clause, right? So for example, we talked about due diligence a second ago, which is seven to 14 days, right? That's the time where you get to do your home inspection, test for radon, check the school districts, make sure there's no sex offenders in the neighborhood, whatever it is that you wanna do to make sure that's the house you want then that seven to 14 day period that you wrote in the contract is the actual time frame that you get to now cancel your contract and get your earnest back on your money back. So if you wrote seven days because you wanted your offer to be competitive and then you change your mind on the eighth day, well, it's too late. You waited too long to request for your earnest money back to cancel the contract. So you have to be aware of the time frame that you're using for due diligence. So if you put seven days, and then you do a bunch of due diligence and realize, holy crap, the roof is completely sagging. It's going to cost us $12,000 to do a brand new roof. We're out. And as long as you do that before that seventh day, assuming that's the day you wrote seven days in the contract, then yes, you can cancel the contract, get your earnest money back. But if it's, you know, again, if you wrote 10 days in the due diligence, then you get 10 days to cancel your contract and get your earnest money back. And if you wrote 14 days, of course, you get 14 days to do that. But there are some cases where people want their offer to be so strong, and usually it's an investor who's going to do this, that is okay with the property being challenged because they're going to go in and fix it up anyway. Um, occasionally you'll see investors that will submit an offer with no due diligence period, meaning, hey, here's my earnest money, it's hard today, meaning I don't get a refund. I can change my mind and cancel this contract though in a week, but you still get to keep that no matter what. Uh, that's a very attractive offer, of course, but a very risky offer. Uh, so it's something that I wouldn't recommend a homeowner to necessarily do, but an investor who's planning on fixing up a bunch of things anyway, it's not as risky. It's still risky, don't get me wrong, but it's just not as risky as the homeowner who wants to move in happily ever after and then not have to fix up a roof at the same time. So, yes, really good question. You're going to want to be very conscientious when you sit down with your real estate agent on how many days of due diligence you're asking for, basing how competitive you want your offer to be. You may want to lessen that. Maybe if you want more, then you, of course, add 14, 14 15 days. Um, but whatever time it is, you need to be on top of getting everything that you want done to determine if that's the house you want to buy done in that time frame. Because if you change your mind, you got to make sure you do that in that time frame. Okay, do you mind if I ask you another question about the earnest money? Yeah, yeah. So what exactly is the earnest money for and where does it go and why does it determine how much you give versus a lower amount? Like you were saying, like you want to put more down if you were more interested. Yeah. Can you just explain? Sure, sure. Just a little bit. So this is the amount of money that you're willing to put up as good faith that you are interested in this home and if for any of any reason you don't fulfill your obligation to the contract that you break you're willing to give that to the other person right so sixty thousand is very attractive in the case that i shared with, with my sister where they live in los angeles and and so if they what the seller looks at when they look at that contract is okay if these people break this contract you know not with the terms that it allows them to break it but if they break it outside of the terms we get to keep 60 grand. So that's a very attractive offer for a seller to look at and go, oh yeah, these guys are willing to risk more money to move forward on the deal. And basically, if they don't fulfill their obligations to what they offered us in this contract, we get to keep the service money. Now, the reality is, most people are not gonna, most people, there of course are situations where it happens, but most people are not going to break their obligation to the contract. That's why we write in there how long we think it's going to take us to do diligence. To do due diligence. So if you think it's going to take you 10 days to get a home inspector in there because they're booked out for 8 days, then of course you're going to want to write 10, 11, 12, however many days necessary. And as long as you fulfill your obligation to that contract, you are allowed to break it. And when you are allowed to break it, under the terms that you've put in the contract to break it, you get your earnest money back. So in many cases, the earnest money is probably not going to be um, forfeited that often. Uh, I have seen it forfeited just 
people make mistakes. Um, it happens, and nobody's perfect. And so I have seen where they lost track of uh, time. Like literally, I know an individual who represented a buyer, and um, for whatever reason in their head, they thought the due diligence was tomorrow, but it really was today. And so they were kind of sitting down and they ended up deciding, you know what, let's cancel the contract. You know, they, they thought they were the day before, right? So, so they're having a conversation at about six or seven o'clock at night after the client gets home from work. And they're like, okay, yeah, I think it's, you know, based off of all the things that we found on the home inspection, let's cancel the contract. So the agent then sent uh, the cancellation of the contract to the listing agent. The listing agent says, well, this, my due diligence expired like two hours ago. It expired today at 5 p.m. It was like 7 p.m. And of course, they lost their earnest money because they were off by a couple hours, right? And uh, that was, they, they literally thought their due diligence was for the next day. So there, there are those reasons why, you know, it can happen. But oftentimes it just shows how serious you are. I'm willing to risk this much. You know, if I don't fulfill my obligations, you get to have this much. So is that really important, would you say? I mean, is that necessary? Can you buy a house without doing that? I mean, what would your recommendation be? Yeah, great question. So, you know, every market's got their go-to amount. So, at, at, you know, in 2008, 9, 10, I don't remember when my sister bought her house, <laughs> the going for, for the neighborhood that she was buying into in Los Angeles, the, according to, and I never, like, fact checked this, but according to the real estate agent, they needed to have put $60,000 of earnest money to be a competitive offer. Um, I didn't question it because Los Angeles is significantly more than Salt Lake City, especially back then. And, and um, I, uh, for years and years, invested in upstate New York City, Kansas City, and of course here in Salt Lake City. So here in Salt Lake City, depending on the price point, you know, earnest money very commonly can be anywhere from I would say one thousand to three thousand dollars. Very common for entry level homes. Of course, if you go higher price point, you may be seeing more earnest money being offered with the contract. In Kansas City, when I used to invest there, I invested in Kansas City for almost ten years, and my earnest money when I would make an offer for entry level homes was as little as ten bucks sometimes, up to five hundred. Very rarely did I offer a thousand for an entry level home in Kansas City. Now, this was probably more. I did most of my purchasing about ten years ago, um, and then held a bunch of stuff over there. Um, it's probably a little bit more, but it was still significantly a smaller. I mean, like earnest money for ten bucks. I mean, that's just like here. If you wrote an offer for ten bucks, you could, um, but. So you might get asked by the other agent, like, hey, did you forget to leave a couple zeros out? You know, like, you're allowed to submit whatever you want for earnest money. But uh, every city has kind of their going rate of what people will offer for earnest money. Um, I've seen also where real estate agents here will suggest that, uh, you know, you do at least 1, 2%, 1 to 2% of whatever your offer is. Um, so... I would say, again, it just boils down to how bad do you want the home. You're making your, you're, you're putting your best foot forward. And when I say putting your best foot forward, you're putting your best foot forward in every aspect of the contract, the highest amount that you can submit, the shortest amount of, let's say, due diligence you feel comfortable with, you know, the most aggressive earnest money that you feel comfortable with. You're basically putting your best foot forward and, and your real estate agent will kind of help you understand what the going rate is for that particular city, that particular market, just because it is a little different in every city. But yeah, um, it, can, it can be, you know, if you get a bunch of offers, a thousand dollar earnest money, it's, you know, to me, to the way my brain works is, it's not that much of a risk, so for me, it's not like that big of a deal, right? Um, even two, three thousand dollars, not that big of a deal. Uh, I don't want to lose two or three thousand dollars, but uh, it's not like it's such an astronomical amount that I feel like, you know, it's that risky. So again, depending on the price point you're playing in, if you're playing in the million dollar homes versus entry level homes versus Los Angeles, Salt Lake City, or Kansas City, it's going to be different everywhere you go, so you just want to double check what the going rate is and what your rate agent would suggest might be competitive. I have seen where agents will submit an offer representing a client on one of my flips and they said, hey, listen, I want you to recognize that we put, you know, a significant amount of earnest money down to show you how serious we are of, 
uh, as far as big, you know, a buyer, and we really, my clients really love your house, and uh, they want to purchase it, and and then there's, you know, but it's I don't know, like here in Salt Lake again for entry level homes, I'm going to say usually it's anywhere from a grand to three grand. Maybe you're going to see four or five uh, entry level. Again, if you go higher, it'd be more. And the only time you lose that money is if you, for some reason, pass the contract time or decide to back out of it, right? Yeah, you'll lose that money for anything that you break in the contract that you agreed that you wouldn't break. So, due diligence deadline, if you pass that deadline and then you change your mind, you lose your earnest money. Or financing an appraisal deadline, which means that is the day that you, can, uh, that you have now officially been approved for your loan it's been appraised, and you can tell the seller, hey, listen, we are officially good to go. If, if you try to cancel your contract after that, then yes, you lose your earnest money there as well. And then of course, if you don't close, I have seen that. I had a buddy who flipped a home, and everything went totally okay. Um, up until the day of closing, my buddy went to the title company, did the closing, went back to work, then he got a call from the title company saying, hey, just want to let you know the other title company who represented the buyers just called us and said the buyers never came in to, cancel, uh, never came in to execute the contract or execute the, the paperwork. Um, they have decided they don't want to buy the house anymore and um, they want to know if you'll give them your, the earnest money back. <laughs> and, and that was the day of closing. And uh, my buddy was like, what? He's like, no, they had, you know, their due diligence period. They had... Everything went okay with financing appraisal. I'm not giving them their earnest money back. They ended up suing my friend. He ended up winning the case, and they never got their earnest money back. For whatever reason, I don't exactly know the full story, but for whatever reason, the day of closing, they just decided that they didn't feel good about buying this house and says, no, 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 we don't want it anymore. The day of closing, which is crazy, because they just spent approximately 30 days going through everything to decide they wanted the home and now they don't want it. <laughs> Makes sense. The whole purpose of this process is to obviously protect, you know, the buyer has to completely stop the purchase or the selling process, Yeah. so, so to speak, as if someone's already put down an offer. So, it, so it's like you said, it's almost like starting over again for the seller. Yes. So it's uh, like the cost of time thing for them. Exactly, exactly. So now my buddy has to go back on the market. I think they had 3,000 earnest money, so he kept the 3,000. Um, like you said, it's the cost of, of the time lost. They have to go back on the market on start all over again, finding a new buyer. Um, so, so yeah, obviously, you know that that number can, you know, you get two offers, the exact same. One's offering you a thousand, one's offering you three thousand, and if it's apples for apples, literally everywhere through the contract, you're going to go with the one that you're going to, you know, with the person who's risking a little bit more high earnest money, typically. And there might be a reason why you might not, based off of conversation you have with the lender going, you know, uh, one of the things that I'll do when I represent a buyer is I will keep in touch with this, uh, excuse me, when I represent the seller or myself, if I am the seller, I'll keep in touch with the buyer's lender and say, how's everything looking? Just want to make sure that no one's lost their job yet, the loan's still looking good, et cetera, et cetera, right? So um, I may get a, I might have a conversation, let's say I get two offers that, uh, submitted at the same time. I'm going to reach out to both lenders who represent each buyer and have a discussion with them saying, you know, how strong of an offer or how strong of a borrower is your client? And if they're like, they're pretty strong, you know, they have a little credit issue, we're working on that, we should be good to go though, don't worry about our deadline. And then I call the next guy and he's like, oh, solid, high credit score, had a job for the last 10 years, you know, makes a lot of money, whatever, whatever. Then I'm going to go apples for apples, I'm going to go with that, with that guy. Just the other one's kind of maybe wishy-washy, may not be able to actually approve for the loan. The other one is I'm getting the vibe that they're solid. Now that's not a guarantee, you know, that solid potential buyer in this economy could lose his job tomorrow and now you're starting all over again. So, okay. um, but yeah, it's nice to, it's nice to uh, have that conversation to kind of get an idea. Yeah, good question. Uh, did you have another one in regards to that? Uh, no, I don't, I don't. Okay, great. So. I am going to, I, I, before the show started, you had asked me a little bit about the process of selling, right? We're talking, yes, yes. right now we're talking about buying. So what we're going to yes. do is take a quick commercial break. When we come back, I'm going to answer your questions that you have in regards to what if you're the seller now? So we've been chatting about what if you're the buyer. 
you know, the different things you have to look out for, make your offer competitive, make your offer strong in this crazy hot market that we're in, people getting out bid left and right. Uh, we talked about how to be as competitive as possible. Now let's talk about the seller, but we will do that when we come back from commercial, so stay tuned. Did you know this napkin? I don't know why I jumped straight to that. It kind of went along with what we were. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. It doesn't have to be that order. Yeah, and I forgot about the selling process. Yeah, I was just going to say it after you were done with that. Like, okay, so let's say I, I decide I want to move. It's been six months. Yeah. And I want to sell my house. What do I do? I was just going to say that next. So. Yeah, yeah, no, that's perfect. See, look what time it is, dude. What time is it? 9.41. No way. It's almost over. What the heck? Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's weird. I thought it would have been 30 minutes. Dude, I looked up and went, I need a commercial break. Because I usually take a commercial break at 9.20. Well, you know, if you ever want me to come and do this with you all the time, I will. Like, if, if you think that it's valuable that I'm being in where my mindset is with this kind of stuff, yeah. I ask questions that maybe have never been addressed before yeah. that you can talk about. And also, I realize something. You don't want to always say, like, it's... It's, it's, there's nothing wrong with you doing a continuous ratio that you repeat the same information sometimes. Yeah, Because what if true. someone's not listening in six months, you start talking about something, and you got new listeners at that point, and like, oh, well, I'm glad that he's repeating that, because there's nothing wrong with repeating certain things every once in a while, right? I agree. So, I agree. All right, here we go. <clears throat> All right, we are back. You are listening to K-Talk Radio, 1640 AM. This is the show, Utah Home Sweet Home. I am your host, Joshi Shiraki. We've got our special guest today, Jason Justice. Jason is getting ready to purchase his next home. Um, and so he had a lot of questions for me in regards to that. You know, he already has, owns currently a home, trying to decide if he wants to sell his home or keep it uh, as an investment property when he moves. You know, a lot of people will basically keep their current residence as a, an investment and then and move into a secondary home or they'll sell their current residence, take all the proceeds and then roll up into a bigger house, you know, some uh, bigger, nicer, better house. That's uh, very, very common, a very common strategy that a lot of people will do. I literally know um, a lady from Canada. She was in, from Canada and she had moved in Canada. She told me, it was a crazy story, that she started off as a single mother raising her kids in a trailer park, right? And knew that based off of her current income, she was never going to be able to provide more for her kids unless she got a better job or considered this strategy she had heard of of people rolling up their real estate. So luckily she owned the trailer and so she ended up when the market had gone up selling it, taking that equity that she now had that she would have never saved up at her current job, took that equity and put it as a down payment on a very modest entry level home and then moved her kids out of a trailer park and she felt that was like the biggest win. And then lived there for a while and then when that house appreciated, she says, oh my gosh, let's just do this again. And did it again and again and again to the point where she was in one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in her city in Canada. And she shares the story with me one day saying, you know, my kids hated me because I moved them all the time. But now that my kids are all grown up, and have had the opportunity to see what I sacrificed, they love and appreciate what I was able to do as a single mother, taking them from a trailer park to one of the best neighborhoods in that in that town, city, wherever she lived in town, I'm not sure, by simply rolling up every few years, you know, some markets that went down, so she had to wait there a little bit longer, but anytime she could have a good amount of, uh, um, amount of equity, she would sell it, put it as a down payment on the next home, and, so, and her payment, more or less, she said, stayed the same because her down payments just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it wasn't like she had more expensive mortgages. That's the beauty about this strategy is if you take all of your equity and put a huge down payment on the house that you go, assuming it's a big, big chunk, then your monthly mortgage payment may still be the same, more or less, as you roll up to a better house than it was in the smaller house, right? And if you take half the equity and go, buy a boat and a car and all that stuff and only put half of it to the next house, then yeah, you're probably going to still have, and you're only putting the minimum down payment, uh, yeah, you're still probably going to have a big monthly payment. But she was, her goal was to say, how can I keep rolling up into a bigger home, but still having the same income, but making sure that my monthly payment for each house stayed the same because I could afford that monthly payment with this income I was making. 
And the way she did that, she just put bigger down payments as she rolled up each time, taking all the equity. And um, so, yeah, really cool story there. Um, and so Jason's, you know, now contemplating, okay, roll up or keep his investment property, right? Kind of just depends. And so he's my guest today because he had so many good questions for me over the phone. I said, dude, you need to be asking me these on air. So now, now we're going to talk about selling because you're maybe going to sell. Maybe you're going to sell and keep your house as an investment. Maybe you'll, uh, or excuse me, you're going to sell and, and utilize it to roll up or maybe you'll keep it. But uh, we already discussed the buying. So now let's discuss the selling. So um, please. Hit me with the first question that you have in regards to selling. Yeah, so what's my first process? Um, when I'm ready to sell my house, I decide that I don't want to keep it. I'm yep. moving to another state. I don't want to have a, a, a rental property. I just want to take the equity and leave. So what would I do when I just contact? Who would I contact first, the real estate agent? Yeah, great question. So in my personal opinion, yes, you're going to want to contact a real estate agent. Now, there's other services out there that are not real estate agents necessarily. Um, their flat fee services. Uh, you don't get a lot of assistance necessarily with some of those. I'm not going to say all of them. I don't know about all of them, but I do know about some of them. And some of them, you're paying a flat fee for a reason. They're allowing you to put your house on the market, on the MLS, um, but they're not really going to assist you through the process when you get an offer, how to look at it, how to decide if it's a strong offer. Um, you know, if you don't know how to look for due diligence periods being shorter versus longer, financing appraisals being shorter versus longer, earnest money being less or more, uh, closing dates, cash offer, strong borrower, pre-qualification um, letter being weak versus strong, you know, calling the lenders of your potential buyers to figure out who's the best buyer potentially, then you are um, potentially leaving yourself for, you know, a lot of unknowns, which can be scary if it's the biggest investment of your life that you're getting ready to sell. So yes, in my opinion, yes, the very first thing you're gonna do is call a real estate agent. And what that real estate agent's gonna do is figure out what the value of your home is in its current condition. So they're gonna come out, they're gonna meet with you at your house, take a peek at it, and then based off of what they see, they can go back onto the MLS, the multiple listing service, and look at all the homes that have recently sold that are very similar in square footage, year, size, basically the things that an appraiser is going to look at to determine value and then condition of course is another one because you can't say this house that's been freshly fixed and flipped and remodeled to the T versus one that's all beat up is going to be the same price just because they're next door to each other um, so they're going to look at condition they're going to look at everything that um, an appraiser is going to look at to determine the value and that's how they're going to say this is the price I think you should list your property at, you should sell at and, and that's important because I hear a lot of People will be, you know, they'll say, well, my neighbor got X amount of dollars, and so I was thinking about the same. And I was like, that's great, that's great. And then I'll pull comps and look at their neighbor's house, and their neighbor's was somebody like me who bought it, fixed and flipped it, and sold it for top dollar, and the house that uh, this other person lives in, you know, is a little rough around the edges. Uh, yeah, price might be similar, but it's not going to be top dollar that a fixed, brand new, every, brand new kitchen, brand new bath. Brand new electrical, brand new plumbing, brand new roof, you know, that's going to demand a higher asking price, a list price than one that's been, you know, that's rough around the edges. So determining that price is going to be then the first thing that your agent and you are going to discuss and uh, determine if that's, you know, worth still selling for or should you keep it? What's your monthly payment? I, I'm working with, the, so my cousin called me recently and um, had some ideas of selling his home. Um, to roll up to another home or keeping his home as a rental um, and buying a second home. And I had asked him, what's your monthly payment for your house? Um, and he shared with me that monthly payment. And that monthly payment, because that loan is older, is so small relative to what he could rent it for today, I had told, you know, I had shared him, I said, in my opinion, I, if I was you, I think the smartest play is to keep your house, rent it out for cash flow and then you know move on to whatever house you want to get um, but your monthly payment is so incredibly small <laughs> based off of such a low interest rate based off of a purchase price that you purchased way back when that this sucker will cash flow like crazy today when the minute you move out and rent it out for market rent value right and so uh, you want to look at a bunch of different factors if you're trying to decide if you can do that uh, keep it for an investment or sell it and roll up like the Canadian lady did so 
You'll know that based off of what you want to sell your house for. How much equity are you going to get? Now that you know how much you can sell your house for, you can calculate how much equity you'll have. Is that equity really worth taking all out and rolling up? Or could you keep that and rent it for more cash flow, which would be maybe a better position you know, in your life to have this extra income coming in? Um, but when, once you know what that price is, then you can get ready to list it. Now, I will meet with clients who will have a house that's a little rough around the edges, not completely, but a little. And they'll ask me, if I fix my fence, um, should I do that before we list it? If my stove is, if I fix my cracked electrical stove, you know, they, those glass stoves, electrical stoves, if I get a new stove in here, should I do that before we list it? You know, they'll ask me all sorts of questions or, or uh, should I do anything to my home to improve the value? And that's a great question. Because if you have the ability to improve your home, you've got a, let's say a budget, a small budget, a big budget, some type of budget that will allow you to improve your home, that you will return more money by the increase of your price of your home than you've spent, then I think it's a great idea. I mean, that's, that's one of the things that I like to do is fix and flip houses. I will spend a bunch of money in a home because I know what I get back is worth the return, right? And so the thing that you need to be careful for though is not every improvement increases the value of your house. So for example, I had a seller that I was helping and that was the fence question. Hey, the fence door was broken. It was like one hinge was on, the other one's off. So it was like you had a, you know, it, it did not function very well, it dangled. And they're like, so should we fix this before we list the home? And in all honesty, that fence, fixed or unfixed is not going to increase the value of the home, right? And so I said, well, if you've got a budget to fix this, what I'd probably suggest is fixing this that I saw inside your house. And, and being that I fix and flip for a living, I know where to spend my money to increase the value of the home. So if you've got a little bit of a budget, you wanna be super careful that you're not wasting that budget on a fence, hinge, door. You know, he wanted to put a brand new door because it, it was beat up and dangling. Um, versus maybe getting a new vanity at Lowe's for your bathroom, which is only like 300 bucks, right? A new vanity can just improve the appearance of a bathroom. A brand new vanity is so inexpensive. If you go to, I like to go to Lowe's for my vanities. You can get at Home Depot too, but I kind of learned who, who has what based off of my taste. So I like to go to Lowe's to get my vanities and my mirrors. <laughs> I go to Home Depot for a lot of other things too, but a brand new vanity that's only a couple hundred bucks, two, three hundred bucks will definitely improve the appearance of the home. It will help with the value versus fixing the fence, which to fix that fence was like two or three hundred dollars as well. And so, um, you know, we discussed what he should spend his money on and that would allow him to ask higher for a list price than what he you know, currently would have been able to ask at that moment. So yes, you're gonna to wanna to call a realtor, have them pull comms, figure out what the value of your house is, and then if you wanna take a step further, determine if there are repairs that you wanna make that will be worth the increase of value of your home to do. And, and worth the headache too, because right, living in a renovation can be a headache. So if it only increases the value of your home by a thousand bucks or whatever, you know, you feel like, oh, we can maybe get a thousand more. I don't, I mean, probably a bad example, but that might not be worth living in a remodeling project, you know, so you got to take in those considerations as well. Yeah. And then after it's on the market, it's pretty much go time where people are going to be walking through your house, you know, um, they're going to be taking a peek at what they're going to be, you know, you might want to hold an open house or you know, at least your agent might want to hold an open house there to get massive traction coming to the home. Um, there are techniques in holding open houses to make your house feel like it needs to be, feel like it's a competitive home to go after so that your offers are stronger when they come in. Um, like for example, for those of you out there who maybe are for sale by owner and you're not gonna hire an agent, but you do wanna have an open house. I typically only do a two hour open house because if you have an open house all day from nine to five, which some people do, um, and I'm not saying that's bad. I mean, that's a great, you know, an open house for a lot of agents will use an open house to find clients. Um, and so they might do a longer window because they want to have the availability to meet more people. But from a standpoint of a seller, 
if you had an open house from 9 to 5, and let's say 15 people came, it's very possible that all 15 people would come at a different time that none of them saw one another. And so they would, sh they would go home, that couple would go home and go, honey, let's lowball that off, that house. Like, there was nobody at the open house. But if you have your open house in a two-hour window, those 15 people will all show up at the same time. They'll all see each other. And let's just, you know, let's call it 15 couples. That's really 30 people. All of a sudden, your house looks like, holy crap, did you <laughs> see how many people were at the open house? Honey, we better submit our best offer possible, right? So there's little techniques that you can utilize as a seller. But that's um, now the time where people are going to start to come through. And at that point, you're going to hope that you get an offer. If you don't get an offer in 14 days, my go-to rule as a seller who fix and flips houses, like not a listing agent, but like the guy who actually owns the home who's selling, my go-to rule is if I don't get an offer in 14 days, I'm probably too aggressive with my price. And it doesn't hurt to try sometimes, but at that point, if, if 14 days have gone by, especially in this market, and you don't have at least an offer, then that's when I tell my clients, you know, you may want to consider a price reduction. Because who doesn't want more money for their home, right? So a lot of my clients were like, well, you're telling me the going rate based off comparables is this price, but can we try higher? Hey, man, you can try whatever you want. I'm just telling you where I think it'll sell. Um, and, I, and more importantly, where I think it'll appraise. Um, but if you want to try $10,000 higher, let's go for it. But in 14 days, if we don't have anything, then you may want to consider at that point a price drop. So, uh, yeah, any other questions? Uh, no, not at this time, actually. Um, I'm sure I'll have some, a lot more coming up but at this point right now. No, I really appreciate the information. It's been really great. Yeah, no. Um, I think it's, uh, it's been fun to answer these questions from, you know, literally somebody who's getting ready to start shopping, who've, who has these questions that are literally coming to their head right now as we speak, based off of, you know, like, okay, what am I going to do here, what am I going to do there? It's one thing to like, kind of think, like, ah, if I was to sell, what would happen? But it's another thing when you're like, I'm now really ready, getting ready to sell. And so now genuine questions are popping up. And you've been asking me so many good questions, I thought it'd be very beneficial and helpful to the audience out there who is also considering selling. So um, if any of you missed any part of this show, please feel free to go to our website, utahomesweethome.com. You can scroll on down to the bottom, click on the social media links. Um, YouTube is where we host all of these shows. We actually film them. And so if you want, you can go onto YouTube, find our playlist, KTalk playlist, and you can actually uh, watch any show that we've ever ever done in the past and get all caught up on the content that's out there. So again, Utah Home Sweet Home. Jason, I want to thank you so much again for joining me today. Oh, thank you. It's been great. Yes. Jason just was smiling at the camera. After I said we film all these shows, he started smiling at the camera. So you can see Jason's beautiful smile. <laughs> all right. Well, you've all been listening to K-Talk Radio 1640 AM. Again, this is the show Utah Home Sweet Home, and I hope you all have a spectacular rest of the day. Okay. Before we part ways, in case you have a dog or know someone else who does have a dog, I wanted to take a quick second to show you the snap leash. The snap leash can literally do so many things and I'm going to share with you one of the many cool things that it can do. As you can see the snap leash is designed with two swivel hooks, one on each end. This end has a cushion stitched into it to make it comfortable when walking your dog. Now all you have to do is take this swivel hook, put it into this very first grommet and now you've got your handle. Okay so now let's imagine you're at the park and you want to secure your pet quickly, safely and easily to a park bench, a tree, or a pole because you just want to sit down and relax. Well, all you need to do is take this swivel hook, remove it from the very first grommet, wrap this leash around any size tree or pole or park bench, and put it into the appropriate grommet, and now you have secured your pet quickly, safely, and easily. And when it's time to head home, another great feature about the snap leash is you can simply wrap it around your waist for hands-free walking. Lastly, if you ever accidentally forget your waste bags at home, these grommets make a great place to fasten the waste bags so you never leave home without them. And if you want to see all of the other cool things that the Snap Leash can do, then please just click on the link below and find out why so many others are falling in love with the Snap Leash.